All right, welcome. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Phil Horner. Um, Phil received his PhD in physiology. Oh, okay, I'm going to say that again. <laughs> it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Phil Horner. Uh, Phil received his uh, PhD in physiology from Ohio State University, where he worked with his mentor, Brad Stokes, on fetal transplantation strategies after spinal cord injury. And so this was back in the mid-90s. Um, so he comes from a lineage of pioneers in this work. Uh, he then took his talents to San Diego uh, as a postdoc in Fred Gage's lab at the Salk, continuing transplantation strategies to promote spinal cord regeneration. Um, and this is where he started an important line of work on the role of endogenous progenitor cells um, in the central nervous system injury. In 2001, he started his first faculty position at University of Washington, uh, doing pioneer, pioneering work on the fate of oligodendrocyte progenitor cells, which many of us study here, after spinal cord injury. Uh, since then, his research interests have diversified and have become even more interdisciplinary, as you will uh, hear about today. Uh, so in, you know, currently, our field is kind of divided into neuromodulation and then regenerative medicine. Um, we often hear about strategies uh, where we can combine the two uh, field. Um, and, you know, in this regard, Dr. Horner has become a pioneer once again, as you will find out shortly. Uh, in 2015, he became the inaugural scientific director of the Center for Neuroregenerative Medicine and the co-director for the Center for Restorative Neurosurgery at the Houston Methodist Research Institute in Houston. Uh, and so without, without much further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Horner. Thanks, thanks very much uh, uh, to Jay Lee for the invitation and to everybody. I've had a lot of fun meeting everyone this morning. I learned a ton. I also learned maybe I kind of wish I'd given my OPC talk today, but um, we have um, some new data there I'm pretty excited about, and maybe I'll try to slip that in if I can keep on schedule. Um, I uh, haven't been here in a while, so it's been really cool to hear what people are up to. I've been really impressed with the science I've heard so far. Um, and it's kind of stimulated some ideas, so I'm, I'm uh, more excited for the afternoon and hopefully um, excited to see some maybe collaborations forming uh, from the visit. So really appreciate it. So I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about why I'm in Houston just briefly. Um, uh, this is the building we're at. We're at the Houston uh, Methodist Research Institute, which is a, it's only been open over about six years, um, and it's really a uh, nascent uh, a kind of a startup, if you will, uh, research institute right in the heart of the Texas Medical Center. How many people have heard of Houston Methodists? Kind of curious. <laughs> Just a few people, probably. Not more than, that's pretty good. So um, many of you may not have heard of uh, Houston Methodists. This is the Texas Medical Center. If you haven't been there, it's like a city within the city. So this is the medical center, and that's uh, downtown. Um, and Houston Methodists is right in the middle of that uh, medical center. So about four years ago, um, I had, well, it was actually about six years ago, I kept getting calls from uh, an old friend of mine who's a neurosurgeon uh, who we trained a little bit together at the uh, University of Washington. And uh, he kept calling me and saying, you have to come down here. It's a great job for the, right, for the right person. It's a great job for the right person. This guy's from South Africa. You know, he speaks in an accent. And he speaks really, really fast. And he just kept calling me, bugging me for like two years. And I had never been to the Texas Medical Center. I'd been all over the country. Uh, seen a lot of really exciting areas and research uh, centers, and I'd never been to the TMC. Uh, so when I flew in and I drove in here, I was sort of blown away. And I like to say it's kind of like the pyramids. No one will ever build it again. Uh, and the reason I say that is it's a bunch of competing hospitals and medical schools all packed within, I mean, they can touch. They're literally the buildings touch. So um, that's a very unique model. And um, it, it somehow works. Um, the reason I got excited about the potential was the research enterprise. So Methodist Hospital used to be the teaching hospital for Baylor College of Medicine. And they got divorced about 14 years ago. And um, they, it was a very ugly divorce, ugly breakup. And uh, so when Methodist went its own separate way, they were a, uh, they've, they've been a top hospital in the country for many years. And they wanted to be in the top 10. So they looked around and they said, what do other top 10 hospitals have that we don't have. And really what they had was uh, research. 
that was about the only thing they didn't uh, have. So they had built really good residency programs um, and uh, a really great model in terms of clinical practice. There are major surgical hospital uh, pioneering in cardiothoracic uh, and transplant uh, and now in neuro, and uh, so how, how could they get there? So they built this building, and they were very smart. So the board decided to build it right in the heart, so right in the middle of the Texas Medical Center. We were literally, uh, behind us is Rice University, in front of us is um, Baylor's uh, neuroscience program. Uh, you know, we're surrounded by, there's Texas Children's, there's a neuro neurologic institute. Uh, UT medical schools, right? I mean, literally all of these places. So it's a kind of a wonderful place for seminars. If you like seminars, it's every day you wake up, you can pick a seminar you can walk to. It's, it's very nice. So I decided to take the plunge. So I left the University of Washington um, where I had, we were building our retirement house there and uh, decided to take this adventure. So I'm telling you all that. It's a little bit to tell you why a lot of the talk I'm going to show you is a lot of new data. So I'm going to, I'm going to describe a project neuromodulation and bringing together the idea of transplantation. We're starting to get good at transplantation. A lot of laboratories are doing this. We can engineer cells in many different ways, but um, integrating transplants and getting them to do what we really want, which is to replace circuitry in the nervous system, I think that's really the next frontier. So we're, we're attempting to do that with neuromodulation. Seemed like a great idea many years ago, and I'll show you how we've kind of moved towards that by building some new tools. This is the center. I thought I would just tell you who's there. So one of the things I've been doing the last oh, four years is just recruiting. Uh, these are the four uh, most recent recruits, and we have a couple other people that uh, we've just recruited. Um, and our goal was to build a center, not unlike that you guys get to enjoy every day, uh, uh, you know, in this really exciting environment and, you know, have this sense of common goal of trying to regenerate the nervous system and in important populations. Um, so we were building it from the ground up. There was really no neuroscience at, um, at the Methodist Hospital. And so we've, we've recruited very broadly. Our goal was to bring multiple disciplines together. And so we have Dr. Krenzuk, uh, who is, uh, he's really an astrobiologist. Um, he builds human asteroids. Um, he's very interested in how astrocytes contribute to synaptic plasticity. Uh, Dr. Viapol is interested in peripheral organ communication, the gut, uh, the liver, and how, that, how those organs communicate with the brain in models of stroke and head injury. Uh, Dr. Sayenko is a human neurophysiologist, his remarkable training, uh, worked with uh, Reggie Edgerton, but pretty much all the luminaries in uh, neuromodulation and does non-invasive neuromodulation in humans and also collaborates with us in some large animal models. And then Elon Wen, who, who studies uh, RNA trafficking, and I'm trying to understand how um, actual, um, how, what's the roadmap for getting the RNAs that we need uh, into the translational center for neurogenesis and axon growth. So that's our, that's our group. Um, it's growing a little bit, but won't grow much more. But um, we've kind of gone from zero to, uh, I think, a really nice uh, functional group. And then um, we have four uh, main areas of emphasis. Um, that we're working on, and uh, these three are, are essentially built, and we're now uh, recruiting in the area of, um, in, in the re neuro rehabilitation side. So we're trying to rebuild a lot of what you have here, but on probably a much uh, smaller scale. So I thought I would tell you that's a little bit about um, where, what I've been doing the last four years, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, when you move, you get the chance to kind of rebuild and think about uh, things. You also get to jettison some things that weren't working well. Uh, sometimes that's projects, sometimes that's people. <laughs> so, uh, Seattleites don't, I mean, for, you know, the typical Northwesterner, how many people have lived in the Northwest? Or you no, a couple, there's one. See, and that just proved my point because nobody in the Northwest would consider moving to Ni Miami. And part of that reason is because they view this area, and particularly Texas, as like, you might as well be moving to Afghanistan, right? It's like this really hostile foreign environment that they've never experienced. So most of my lab did not leave and uh, Seattle. So when I moved to Seattle, you get to, you know, a lot of, I'm sorry, when I moved to Houston, lots of rebuilding and thinking about what I'd like to do in some of it, which were extensions of what we were doing. So this is essentially what we're trying to do. So I, I like this graphic because um, if you, you know, the 90s was the decade of the brain. We worked out a lot of the molecular pathways that control uh, the development of different neuronal subtypes. And now, you know, even more recently, we really have uh, remarkable fidelity on 
what uh, transcriptional regulators are for different types of interneurons in the spinal cord, for example. So we've really progressed far and through, uh, you know, induced pluripotency and cell reprogramming, cell engineering, we can really produce almost every neuron subtype in the brain. And we really are close to being able to do that. And that's what's represented here. So we really have that. It's kind of our toolbox is this. And I won't dwell much on that, but, uh, you know, even in our lab, uh, you know, we have high school students now we do, that do the IPS work. It's just not that hard to do. Um, yeah, not that doesn't say there's lots to be done, but it, it tells you that you, we do have these remarkable tools. And I won't dwell on that much, but the idea that I can produce an excitatory interneuron from a particular segment of the spinal cord in a dish in relatively high percentages is really remarkable when you think about it. That's where we are today. So getting those into the nervous system, of course, and this is a simplistic view of the nervous system, it's not just having all of these components. They've got to be in these very specific ordered structures with interrelated pathways and communication. So how do we create uh, this complexity, right? So how do we recreate, we go from here to here? And that's been a challenge, and people have been transplanting these cells, uh, stem cells, differentiated progeny from stem cells, with great success. And I'll show you some examples of that. But not a lot of great success in terms of uh, integrating a specific population into the circuit you want to repair. Okay. So uh, this uh, is Donald Hebb. So everybody knows Donald Hebb, right, if you're a neuroscience, right? So uh, Donald Hebb is really remarkable, right, because in 1949, if you read, uh, you know, psych psychiatry or neuropsych uh, texts from that time, there's some really, it's a really fun reading, actually. If you're bored over the holidays, pick up a text from the 40s. I mean, it is fascinating what we thought, how the brain worked, at least from a neuropsychiatric standpoint. And you have kind of a luminary here, Donald Hebb, who had this very simple idea that is that neurons that fire together wire together, uh, and we now commonly refer to that as Habian theory. It has various flavors, but it makes a lot of sense. That basically all of development is when uh, circuitry are being activated, when they're activated in similar fashions, or they're speaking the same uh, language, that neurons have a tendency to strengthen the synapses in those uh, particular pathways. Simple idea. So um, Chet Moritz approached me a number of years ago and asked, why don't we take this concept um, and see if we can use that to integrate transplants? So that's the basis of it. And this is a simple diagram, right? So you have cell A, this is the way it's, this is its firing pattern. Here's cell B. And because the patterns are similar, they hook up. And cell C, you know, sings a different tune, isn't interested, and, and doesn't connect. So uh, another simple diagram. We're focused um, mostly on, right now, forelimb. So we're interested in uh, cortical spinal control of uh, reaching and grasping. So the cortical spinal tract illustrated here. Uh, we're doing an injury in the cervical spinal cord. And in our, in our very simplistic way, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to integrate descending input that's spared uh, with motor neurons that are spared. And I'll go into a little more detail in the model. And we're, we're trying to do that in a couple of different ways. We're making proprioceptive neurons and excitatory interneurons, and these are the cells that we're trying to transplant and trying to integrate into this damaged circuit. So it's a really simple idea, um, not easy to do. So uh, let's talk a little bit about motor columns just really quickly, and that'll um, help you understand some of the modeling that we did and why we did it. So a lot of you, I'm sure, know that uh, we all learn this in neuroscience that motor columns exist, that, you know, all the motor uh, neurons for, uh, for example, for the, um, for the bicep don't all come from one particular spinal segment. They're lined up over multiple segments. One thing you may not know, which is really illustrated very nicely in this paper um, by, by Tosolini and Morris, is that these uh, columns are often organized in parallel structures. So, um, these are the motor neuron columns, right? So this is in cervical C5 to C8. And these are motor columns that are innervating the triceps. And you can see they're not all bunched into one big column. They're actually in parallel columns. So that's an important concept that we'll end with. Another way to look at it is this. You can turn the spinal cord on its side, and you can look at these columns for the different uh, motor pools. And you can see, again, these overlapping and some not overlapping pools next to each other uh, in the gray matter. So that, that's the structure, but most of the time when we make a motor neuron uh, or an excitatory interneuron, because excitatory interneurons and the proprio spinal neurons are also organized with these neurons in columns, is we make them as a suspension and we squirt them 
into the spinal cord. And um, so the long-term goal of what we're doing is trying to figure out how, how can we get those cells to align and integrate into these, uh, what nature creates over time during development into these elongated columnar structures. So I'm first going to tell you a little bit about the model. This is Sarah Mandelo, who's uh, now uh, a uh, early stage faculty at UW. She was a postdoc uh, with me and Chet Moritz. And uh, when Chet and I uh, began working together, he was working in uh, primate and we were working in mouse. We had switched, when I moved to UW, I decided to do all mouse for the genetic models. Um, but he didn't think he could get neuromodulation equipment in a mouse. And uh, so we decided to meet in the rat. And this was the model that uh, Sarah helped us develop. Um, so it was based on an Ohio State impactor. It's an impactor that um, uh, was developed um, it, uh, with, I guess, two main, I, I, I like to think of there's two main real benefits of this particular model. It's a complicated model, not a lot of people use it, um, but uh, one of the things that it's capable of doing is um, has this, this electromagnet that can be oscillated and it's a, a bunch of uh, sensors, there's a force transducer, displacement transducer, and an accelerometer on there. But what you can do with it, and it's useful in multiple models, is that you can uh, oscillate against any surface and you can get force feedback from that surface in a non-injurious way. And what that allows you to do is when you're setting the probe on the spinal cord to create a contusion injury, if there's anything in the way of the probe, and that's uh, anything that you, even the surgeon thinks the site is clear, the probe can detect it. That can be bone or like a little tiny piece of bone that you don't see, or it can be a little bit of um, uh, connective tissue or even that little membrane for those of you who do laminectomies, you know what I'm talking about, it can actually detect that. So then we don't do the injury, the surgeon fixes the site, and then it comes back. So that's one of the main uh, advantages of it. The other is, is that it gives you uh, relatively um, uh, uh, very uh, good uh, biomechanical data of the injury process itself. And that biomechanical injury data um, looks um, actually here. It looks like uh, this. This is just the trajectory of the probe. And uh, this is the hit, and then the probe comes back and it's retracted. Um, but we can look at the, um, the smoothness of the force curve uh, during the hit. And again, if that probe hits anything on the way down, it actually will change uh, that sine wave. So if it's all spinal cord, you have a nice smooth sine wave. But if you're hitting something, uh, you get an interrupted wave. Uh, of mixed materials, and then we know we don't use that animal. So I'm telling you a lot of that to tell you why I think that the model is a good one, but really uh, what it allows you to do is create relatively tight groups uh, with good control. And so in this case, what Sarah did is try to dial in uh, an injury paradigm in the cervical spinal cord where she could get uh, different recovery levels. And so this is an IVB score. This is a, um, animals uh, eating uh, a, a pellet. They rotate it and they use their fingertips and we score the fingers. Uh, and you can see this is be heavy injury. So this is normal and this is a heavy injury and a moderate injury. So you can titer uh, the injury and it's a hemi contusion is what we've been working with primarily, although you can do, uh, uh, you don't have to do hemi, you can do an entire uh, injury across the midline. But we do hemi contusions, you get a cyst because this is rat. Um, and you can see we have ablate a lot of the gray matter, a lot of white matter here. Um, but I believe, yeah, so in this figure you can see this is looking at tissue sparing and motor neurons, and this is rostral caudal. This is the injury site here, and you, what you see is that right at the impact site you basically blow out all the motor neurons, so the in, impact site's at C4, and uh, this will be important later, so you're, 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 you're blowing out all the motor neurons there, a lot of the white matter there, but you're not really um, destroying the motor neurons that are caudal, and that was by design. So we wanted to have a model where uh, the motor neurons that are in columns that project to the forelimb would still be intact. So we'd have something to connect uh, back up to. And that's illustrated here with this relatively focal loss, uh, rostral and caudally. Okay, so um, let's see here. Um, and this is looking at uh, uh, white matter loss. Again, so this is showing we can have graded amounts of white matter. That are, that are lost from the injury, but you really lose um, a lot of the lateral funiculus, ventral lateral funiculus, and you have some sparing of the dorsal columns, but the cortical spinal tract is pretty heavily injured. Okay, so there's a lot of characterization. This is the forelimb reaching task. I've been uh, in a rat, and this is uh, the task that we've been using. I was very impressed to see um, what Vance Lemon is up to in mice here. 
Um, so we're still in the old world. So this is a uh, healthy rat. You'll see they're really good at this. So reach, grasp the pellet through a gap. We figure out whether they're left-handed or right-handed. Uh, and then we do the injury on their preferred side. So that's what it looks like before injury. And then this is our moderate uh, injury. Lost my cursor here. There it is. And, and you can see that the rat can extend the limb, right? But there's really very little pronation, supination, and almost no grasping. And that's where we focus our pretty much the whole program on that. Um, in, in the, in the uh, coming slides I'm going to show you. So we had a model. We, had, we knew that the motor neurons were still there for grasping, or at least most of them are there for grasping, pronation and supination, because we are, our, our injury is primarily above that. Um, and we knew that they could still orient the arm, they can still uh, extend the arm relatively well, but not grasp. So um, this is the team, oh, and Michael Kasten's photos disappeared for some reason, but uh, this is the team that we worked with uh, to, to, to initially just work out neuromodulation in the rat. So this is Chet, uh, Michael Kasten, and Michael Sunshine, both of them who have moved on uh, to great places, We're both really, really good, productive people. Michael was, uh, actually Michael ended up down here, I think, somewhere, no? Anybody heard of Michael Kasten? I'm sorry, Michael Sunshine? Nobody? <laughs> Okay. Uh, anyway, so I uh, thought that might be, maybe I got that wrong. But anyway, so Michael was a technician, a really, really talented technician and ended up going to graduate school. So, um, so this is uh, Michael's paper um, and uh, illustrating what, what we've done anatomically. So this is a uh, four electrode array that's implanted um, just below the lesion. So here's our lesion, C4, C5. And we implant this uh, array into um, the caudal circuitry, and we find motor pools that will elicit either grasping or uh, pronation and supination and isolate those regions. And there's some data from that. So this is, um, uh, uh, let's see here. So this is, actually, this is actually just showing the durability of the system. So um, the experiment is uh, the animals get an injury. First, actually, the electrodes are implanted. Animals get an injury. And then a few weeks after the injury, we start stimulating. And uh, we don't actually elicit movements. We use a stimulation protocol of about 90% of threshold. So the idea is that we're just bringing the motor pools just up to threshold, but we're not actually stimulating during the motor behavior. So the idea is that we raise that. So if there's any um, spared input, they can elicit a firing of that motor neuron. So that's the paradigm. Um, and this is just showing that the electrodes can work for weeks. This is week one, week 12. And so this is the, these are just control experiments showing that we can elicit um, uh, different movements over time. It doesn't really degrade. Um, we are able to stimulate over relatively long periods of time. And then this is some behavioral data from animals. Um, and we get an improvement. So red is stimulated, uh, blue is unstimulated. Um, and what you see is we have improvement in pronation, uh, digit extension, uh, even in some advance here. And these, um, importantly, these are improvements that are with the stimulator off. So we stimulate for a few weeks and you begin to see some improvement in forelimb function. Um, and, and it's not stimulator dependent. So it's obviously the recovery is dependent upon having the stimulator on for weeks, um, but it isn't um, required. So there is some plasticity here. So we're gonna do some Habian plasticity in theory um, we've done a little bit of work to try to figure out what uh, anatomically or even neurophysiologically is underlying this, and uh, I can tell you we don't have a really good uh, solution to that, really good clue. Um, and here's a, a graph showing this is during the stimulation, so for uh, five weeks of stimulation, and then this is the stimulators off, uh, and just show you that the, the benefits are stable. So over time, this is no stimulation. <laughs> Uh, the animals have improved. So it's a relatively fast effect and it leads to lasting uh, improvement. Yeah. yeah. We are, and it's not always, it's not just, they're actually stimulated for four hours a day. So it's during, they have, during the behavior, but also just during a uh, free, free moving session. So we swap them in and out of a room where they can be, a, this is a tethered system. Um, and so they're there for four hours freely behaving, and then during the uh, learning and memory tasks, I'm sorry, the forelimb reaching tasks, they are also stimulated. 
So that's the, this got us really excited. So we were, I was really impressed. We didn't really think that um, we would get a benefit that quick and um, we were really excited about it. So then it was the time to put cells in here. So that was our goal. Let's put some cells in here because if we can do this much, we can get it. I, and I, I realize I don't have a video in here, but to put it in perspective, what you see is you start to see, uh, I don't want to put it into perspective. It's like you see an improvement in the success rate, but what it really is, it's a, it's a pretty modest improvement in closing of the hand. I have a lot, some EMG data I could show you. I don't, I see, I don't have that in here, but I, I but you, it's not, a, it's not, it's not from, you know, you saw the video where they don't grasp much at all. Their hand is relatively um, you know, flaccid, it doesn't really contract the, the digits at all. It goes from like, the, you know, get a little bit of contraction and a little bit of mobility about the wrist. It's enough for them to get a pellet uh, better more often, but they're not fully grasping it. So I wanna make sure I put that in perspective. So we were excited about it, but not necessarily, it wasn't, you know, full minute recovery. Um, in some further work, um, we found that you can stimulate longer and you can extend uh, some of that benefit. So. Uh, but what's the downside of this? So, I, uh, you know, we had our eagerness here was to put, first we thought, well, let's just put some stem cells in there. It'll be electrical activity. Stem cells will be in there, and we're going to get something magic will happen. Um, and I'm going to skip a whole bunch of data and just show you one, one main point, and that is that um, we, we had a very, it was a very, uh, uh, it was a neurosurgery resident who went ahead and stopped neurosurgery residency, finished, his, did a PhD with me and then left. Very, very talented, very good at making engineered cells, neural stem cells, et cetera. And he put a variety of different cell types in this model and he got very poor survival. So um, where he's injecting these cells is uh, just rostral to the electrode array. So in between the lesion zone um, and his, the survival is just really plummeted. And this is just a picture of what the electrode zone looks like. So this is GFAP. And what we, what we found are these really big barrel-shaped uh, scars around the electrode array. Um, so uh, we found that there, there's uh, obviously scarring around the electrodes. Um, in some animals, there's uh, uh, infection, and we found failure at about a year. So these are problems that a lot of people talk about with penetrating electrodes, particularly in the spinal cord. But things people hadn't talked about, which is really this scarring environment, is maybe not conducive for transplantation. So um, I'm not going to show you all the failed transplants attempt because they're really, it's really boring data, right? It's, a lot, it's just not really good. And in control experiments, we get good transplant survival. So this was really disheartening. So um, when I, this is about the time when I moved to Houston, uh, we began thinking about um, this uh, uh, issue and thinking about how to get around it. This is a paper that uh, was from Reggie Edgerton's group uh, where they used a multi-electrode array uh, to stimulate um, the cervical spinal cord in a rat. And uh, this is from the dorsal surface in the cervical region and what you can see in their um, uh, data set, there's a, a small improvement in advance, a, a improvement in supination, and um, release of the pellet. But um, what they found is that, that only they got those benefits when the stimulators uh, were on. So this is the red line you see here. So in their report, if the stimulators turn off, they didn't see the benefit. So, um, we, we wanted to consider this as a potential um, way to do the experiment, uh, but we weren't sure exactly how we were going to do it. Plus, we were a little worried about um, the lack of improvement with, uh, without stimulation on. So, so this is active neuromodulation uh, uh, versus uh, what we found in our experiment with penetrating electrodes. It looks like you get some plasticity that's lasting. Okay. So this is, I realize, uh, this is the transplant experiment, um, just to give you a little background before we go into what these, the new, the new stimulators look like. So these are, uh, this is the work uh, again by Sam uh, uh, Nutt, who was the uh, neurosurgery resident, uh, becoming PhD student. And what he did is he took very early neural progenitors. Um, these are IPS derived neural stem cells, I should say. He cautalizes them with ret retinoic acids. So they're a, a stem cell that's derived from the spinal cord. Um, and then um, we do things like look at telomerase activity to show that um, there are not any uh, pluripotent cells left. 
Um, and then we had a couple of markers we used uh, to select for the neural uh, precursor. I don't want to put too much into this again because, again, it was a failed experiment. So this is um, what he discovered. So these are, this is, again, here's the electrode array. This is the cell transplant. And these are the kinds of things that he observed. Um, HU nu is a human nuclear marker. You can see a, a grouping of cells that are HU nu labeled and they're expressing GFAP. So you take a cell that's multipotent in a dish, it's making neurons, oligodendrocytes, and astroglia, but when you put it in near these electrodes, um, you get these sort of very gliotic regions. So it was very, very disappointing. I think this is human GFAP, so you can appreciate that. And uh, it didn't matter if the stimulator was on or off, so that those graphs there show you that even with some stimulation, you don't get good uh, integration. And so I apologize, this paper is in here twice. So this is, this is Reggie Edgerton's paper. So we just went over that, I apologize. So what, it, what we wanted to do was to take from Reggie's data and see if we could do a non-invasive neuromodulation approach to try to get uh, stem cells to um, uh, integrate. So testing this Habian theory. So the team for that is uh, this group here, Sean Barber, who's a neurosurgeon, who um, he's now on faculty. Uh, Kun Jang Yu, who uh, works at UH, does uh, flexible electronics. And then Matt Hogan is a postdoc in the laboratory. And what we uh, hypothesized, and we got, a, we got a grant from Wings for Life, was the idea to make multi-electrode arrays. And we had the hypothesis that coming from the dorsal surface, one of the drawbacks of coming back from the dorsal surface is that, um, so if you look at, this is a cutaway of the spinal cord, the activation threshold for the sensory route is much lower than that of the motor uh, route. And so um, we know this, that's one of the benefits maybe of neuromodulation from the dorsal surface is that you activate the sensory circuit as well as spinal circuitry. So you activate some sensory information going up to the brain, but you also activate the sensory route really uh, easily. And that may be, that's beneficial if you're trying to activate um, the whole spinal circuitry. If you're interested in trying to get targeted uh, integration of a, a cell population, you'd kind of like to get just the population you want to integrate with with your transplant to be uh, stimulated. So we hypothesized that if we made an electrode array and we place it ventrally, we might be able to create currents that would activate motor pools uh, specifically. And um, we received some funding from Wings for Life to build the system. And so we set out to be, we were very ambitious. Um, uh, we decided not only to do that to create this ventral system, which hadn't been done in rodents, but also to make it completely untethered. So we wanted to make something uh, that we, we thought the tethering was stressful for the animal, especially for long periods of time during the day. So can we eliminate that and to make this a more versatile system? So um, this is the system that we, we generated. Um, uh, this is the multi-electrode array. I'll show you a little more about that. Um, it's a completely wireless system. So this is the, the there's a wireless chip here. Initially, we did it with a, uh, uh, we used a watch battery in there. Now we're using an RF uh, rechargeable system. Um, so that's the box. It fits on the haunch. And then the electrode array is threaded uh, across the back. And then it turns out to be very difficult surgically to implant one of these because the dorsal roots are really tight together in the cervical region. So when you dive down in there, if you want to put an electrode underneath uh, in the cervical region in a rat, there's very little space to work on. And you almost always will damage the roots. And when you know, and I see many people nodding their heads, if you, if you damage those roots, you've really uh, influenced this model tremendously. So what we came up with uh, after multiple approaches turned out to be pretty difficult is we, we actually go in at uh, T4. So at the T4, T5 junction, we make a little lateral laminectomy, and then we slide this electrode under T4 and thread it all the way up into, you can go all the way up to C3, C2 if you do that. And the animals tolerate it really well. So this is a little closer view. There's two different electrodes, and I'll explain why. The first one was somewhat rigid, and then we made one that was very, very thin and super flexible. And in fact, this one is so flexible, you can't insert it. So we have to use a, uh, we use a 3D printed uh, guide probe, and then we use fibroin adhesive to attach uh, the electrode to it. So, um, and that's what you use to insert and then that fibroin adhesive at body temperature basically slowly dissolves and you can remove the guide probe. 
So if you look, uh, this, is, this is a spinal cord. There's one of these electrodes. You can see where it's placed. Um, the other thing that you know, we could never have planned, but basically if you go from the thoracic side on one, you know, on the left side of the animal, the probe ends up on the right side. So it's perfect for neuromodulation on the right. If you go on the right, it comes out on the left. Just turns out that's the way that it works. So it turned out to be really handy because we were actually really worried, like what happens if it's at midline sometimes and whatever. So here's an example. I hope you can see it. There's the spinal cord. So what um, Matt has done is remove the vertebral column. And you can see as we're looking at the bottom, and here's the electrode coming up, and uh, that's the, uh, the actual array part right here. So it fits there very nicely. Animals that were implanted with these, uh, stiff ones, didn't tolerate it. They tolerated it okay, but they did have some motor deficits after two or three months. Um, with these electrodes, we've had animals now for uh, six months, just normal controls without any, they appear to tolerate really, really well. So, Success, but it took a lot. There was a lot. Uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, disappointments along the way. There was a lot of challenges. So, um, and even getting the wireless system, etc. So, there's a lot that went into this that uh, more than meets the eye. So, what was really cool? This particular experiment. This was the first time we we used the original array in a intact animal, just an acute prep, and uh, whoop, this got us really excited. So. Well, maybe it won't be that exciting. <laughs> oh, that's really strange. Did I pause it somehow? Oh, there he goes. So I hope you can appreciate there's like a single digit. We actually get like a pinky. So we can get individual digits uh, depending upon how we stimulate in the electrode array. And the audio on this is pretty funny. I, I told him not to play the audio because, uh, you know, Matt just, like, I think he did a, said a bad word because he was so excited. Because even with the penetrating electrodes, we were never were able to get single digit. So um, what we're stimulating um, is open for debate, and I'll show you some more data. But um, we could be stimulating the ventral root. We think we're actually stimulating the motor columns, and I'll show you some data of why we think that is, although uh, we have yet to prove it. So this got us really excited. It told us that the ventral approach, that's something we couldn't do either with a dorsal array or penetrating electrode array. It tells us that we can perhaps isolate some of these motor pools. So we're marching forward with this. I'm going to show you a little more data um, and some transplant data. So this is just EMG data. So we, we put EMG electrodes in a variety of muscles in the forearm. Um, this is just showing examples of that data. And I want to show you this. So this is, um, I think this might be a movie too. Okay, so what you're going to see here is um, we can stimulate in two patterns. One is we can stimulate an electrode uh, ventrally, and we have a reference electrode above the cord. So we're stimulating across the cord. This isn't exactly like a dorsal stimulator, but it's similar because the, you know, the reference is away. So we're stimulating across the cord. The act, we're clearly activating the dorsal roots. In this mode, we're stimulating just point to point, so along the ventral surface. And so one of the questions we kept asking ourselves is, what's the difference? Is there a difference? So what you're going to see is a movie. You'll see this green bar. Um, and this is Matt bringing the electrode from the high cervical region all the way down to the upper thoracic region. And then uh, you'll see the muscles light up um, representing the EMG signal. And let's see if that one will play. OK. So what you see is that for the, I hope you can appreciate, for the upper limb, especially in the higher cervical, they're very similar. But what you see is that when you get down into lower thoracic here, you really, it's the only area, I'm sorry, lower thoracic, lower cervical and upper thoracic, it's the only the ventral stimulator that really gives us um, fine control of the hand. I'll play it one more time, and then I'll show you some different ways to look at it. So you see the shoulder, upper musculature, these aren't really discrete, right? And, uh, and there you get this whole, whole limb, and it's only right here in this region of the uh, lower cervical and upper thoracic that we get specific activation of the hand. And why is that interesting? Well, if you're trying to neuromodulate in the hand and control the hand, this is, in a non-invasive way, this is really um, the only way I know to do it. Maybe with penetrating electrodes you could, but this is a great way to do it semi-non-invasively. Um, so we were pretty excited about that. So this is, um, oh, I just, <laughs> okay. So, um, and then, uh, and this just breaks out some of the things uh, I wanted to show you. But you can see here in this region, we can get some very, very specific. So what do you get if you stimulate here, right? So what if you're in this zone in either of these two paradigms? What do you think, what do you think you get? 
Anybody done anything like that? What do you think the animal does, I guess? That's the question. Yeah, so you, get, you can either get reaching or you can get a complete withdrawal. But you often get, you either get, and it's a rigid, sort of a rigid extension. It's not a rhythmic extension. It's just, you know, full extension or full retraction. And so that's less useful for us, we think, for rehabilitation, whereas here we can get relative fidelity. So another way to look at this is this is just a, a plot of these EMG data, and you're looking at different muscles rolling out here. And I just show you that, again, in this C7 to T1, these are... Uh, these are the wrist uh, and hand flexors here. You can see we can get very specific activation where we don't get that here. What, what, it, the way to read this is that you can see you get some activation in the hand and wrist, but you also get all of these other muscles up in that same lane. So you don't, you don't get that selectivity. So again, this is point to point and point to reference. And now, what else can you do with this? You can do a lot with this, even just in acute prep, to start mapping. So we've done motor mapping with penetrating electrodes, but no one's really done it with surface electrodes. Um, and so we can start to do some motor mapping. So what you're looking at here, again, these are just relatively early data. This is a uh, point to reference, so stimulating ventrally, stimulating uh, or uh, with a reference electrode across to the reference electrode, which is located dorsally. Uh, and these are, so these are short uh, interval pulses, so uh, very short latency pulses, and looking at either suppression or facilitation. And uh, again, this is going from C4 to, lower, uh, to upper thoracic and the different muscles you see, that in general, most of, uh, of what you see with the short pulses are facilitation in this area with the uh, point of reference. And then if you look at uh, the point to point, we can get very specific um, uh, facilitation, again, within the hand and wrist flexors. So motor runs recruit muscles, right, by short pulse. That's kind of how you get, uh, how you regulate the amount of contractile force. So again, early data, but this suggests that we may be able to control with this tool, not just closing of the hand, but actually is it a light close, a heavy close, or intense, you know, so we can actually maybe control that output. And we think that's going to be really important because those uh, processes are going to be different depending upon what the task is and what you're trying to retrain. Okay, so um, I realize I'm not watching my time at all. Is there a clock in here just so I can see where I am? No? Let me, let me, 15 minutes. Okay, I think we can get there. All right, so this is, um, this is work going back to... Um, uh, Sam Nutt again, so this is that uh, neural progenitor line, and this is what it should have looked like. I showed you what it, I showed you there's not very happy transplants in the electrode array, but if you put these cells just in a, a cord that doesn't have electrodes, you know, you get really big transplants. So Hugh New is against a nuclear marker, double cortin is a neuronal marker here, and you can see we get, you know, tons of cells and they make elaborate processes and we get almost no change in behavior, okay, with these transplants. Um, so engraftment isn't, you know, we, we can engraft. I guess the slide is really just to show you that that's, <laughs> we, we know how to do that, and we get good engraftment. Um, so what we've been doing now is making V2A interneurons in an early foray to see if we can make the excitatory relays again between the spare descending input and this motor circuitry we're, we're building. So this is just an experiment that we did. We're injecting, and I, this is kind of important for what I'll tell you about at the last minute, is that we're putting 200,000 cells in. And I think almost everybody agrees. I mean, there's a lot of people using a lot of different tools to try to increase graft survivability, but most transplants you put in, you put 200,000 cells, you lose a huge majority of those cells, and then some make it back up. So there's this some stage in progenitor uh, or progenitor phase that's really uh, versatile, doesn't mind being transplanted, and then there's you know, this cliff where you've, you've, you know, you've got some neural commitment and they're very unhappy in transplanting. And we've known about that spec since the day of fetal transplantation, right? So, but I want to make that point because I want to show you something, I think, I, some new data that's cool in the end. So, um, so now what you're looking at is transplanted cells, V2A, interneurons, not pure. At this stage, we're still, it's pretty low purity. I think we're 25% in the culture, which at the time that was sort of the standard. So um, we're getting better at that. But, you know, they're, they're pushed towards a V2A uh, lineage. And what you're looking at is that you're getting, again, you get these wild circuits um, that are growing. This is unstimulated population. You make these big balls of cells. A lot of cells migrate too. Um, 
And this is uh, with the uh, current, so this is with stimulating ventrally. And we begin to see elongation of fibers and coming out uh, into the tissue. And so that, that was uh, really exciting. This is another way that Matt quantified it. Um, this is looking at individual cell uh, orientation. And the blue here is showing you the orientation along the um, current field. And then the, the red is without current. And I think you can appreciate that we get um, this uh, ordered alignment. So this is ordered alignment now within uh, the gray matter. And so this even in and of itself is not enough, but it's, it's certainly encouraging that you, by they're actually creating a current field that we can direct at least the morphology and maybe even the orientation of the cells where we need them to go. So I have um, one last quick story I'm gonna tell you about in the last couple minutes. Um, and what we're, but before I leave this, what, what Matt is doing now is, is starting to look at um, whether the neurons that we have transplanted now, are there more or less synapses, uh, are we influencing their uh, interaction with the target population? So do we see interaction uh, with the ventral motor pool that we're trying to hit? Uh, and those studies are ongoing and, and uh, hopefully maybe it won't be four years uh, before um, we can present that data. So the last thing I want to tell you about is, so we've gotten really excited about the data that we can create these current fields, that we can perhaps stimulate relatively specific motor populations, motor programs, and putting cells in. So we've teamed up with um, a collaborator. This is Janet Palou and uh, 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 graduate student Zachary Olmsted, and this is Chinzia Sigliano from my laboratory. She's a postdoc, and Matt Hogan, as you've, you've been introduced to, um, and we've been talking with the Palou Lab about an idea. So if, if these motor pools are organized as motor pools, and can we get away from injecting cells as just a blob of cells, you know, suspension? Can we actually somehow pre-organize um, either an interneuron column or motor neuron and interneuron columns together? Can we do that in a way that could then be transplanted? And that's what I'm going to show you in this the last minute here. So what uh, they've come up with are, uh, we're calling them or she's calling them microribbons. Um, and what they are is alginate. So alginate is a natural material secreted by algae. And uh, it degrades pretty quickly uh, in the nervous system. Uh, neurons like it, especially if you add um, uh, neuronal matrices such as laminin, you can get um, really good survival. So this is, these are IPS cells embedded in them. They survive in clusters. You can make them really long. You can make them in a variety of different uh, diameters. So we started to think about what sizes we need, et cetera. And so this is kind of where we are. And, and this, is, uh, this is a paper um, we're just about to submit. Um, so the idea is we've built motor neurons. We've made interneurons, as represented in the blue. So the idea, can we make these columns? And then in the beginning, we're just going to put one column in there. But the idea would be in a fantasy world where you'd have just the right tools, or maybe in a bigger animal, you could begin to make specific columns. And then they'd be laying there and wait to be hooked up. Right? That's the idea. Um, and this is, this is just some examples of how you could mix and match uh, some of these different populations. So we've made, these are stem cells, IPS cells, and then you can differentiate them in these columns and mix them uh, into bundles so you can imagine like this. So this is the idea. This is the science fiction idea. Um, this is the experiment we did. We did some calculations on what sizes we need and everything. And what, so how many motor neurons are there in the rat spinal cord? First of all, how, how many people know that with that is? Give me a guess. Can you tell me? Is it hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands? Is there a student in here that we should know this? Um, well, you don't. You, that's a, I was looking for a student. Yeah, there's thousands. And so when you think about a specific motor group, some of them there's hundreds. Uh, you know, for one muscle group, maybe 300, right? So well, how many stem cells do we put in? Nobody puts in 100 stem cells or 1,000 stem cells, right? We put in. 100,000, 200,000, or 2 million, depending upon the laboratory. So, um, so, so these two concepts don't work together. If you have to put 200,000 cells in to end up with 10,000 neurons, that's not going to fit in these ribbons. So that was our, sort of our big concern. 
Um, oh, sorry, this is, this is just the differentiation process that he used to make these spinal motor neurons. I don't want to show that because I'm running out of time. And this just shows that in these, um, in growing in these columns, that they can, so here, here's one of these uh, ribbons, and this is a, a muscle cell, and they make motor end plates. So it's just, um, this is just Zach's quality control. Nothing new here, right? People know how to make. In fact, the motor neuron is kind of a default pathway once you cautalize the IPS cell. It's pretty easy to make motor neurons, and high, it was like one of the first I, you know, ES cell derived cells was the motor neuron because nature makes them by default. So he's made them, just shows he can get them high purity and put them in these columns. So this is our first attempt to put them in the injured spinal cord. So you're looking uh, down the barrel of the dissecting scope before injection and then right after injection. So we've made a modified needle that has a bend in it so we can go because we want to be tangential. So again, these motor columns have to come from the dorsal surface. Uh, and this is, they're fluorescently labeled, so here's the spinal cord, and you can see one of these uh, ribbons that's been placed. Um, you know, not unlike the surgery for the ventral stimulator, it's like we're, this is really hard to do. <laughs> it's just really difficult to do, and we're still working on it, and I would say we do it poorly, but poorly enough that we get survival, okay? That's, I'm gonna be that boastful, as boastful I can be. Very hard to do. In fact, if somebody knows how to do this better, um, you know, really micro implantation. Um, I'd love to talk to you. So, uh, so this is what they look like. Um, uh, this is a week later, I believe, after you put in uh, 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 the ribbon. So you put in this ribbon, and we tried to target it right in here. And what do you see? Is you start to see. Um, uh, let's see here, where am I? Oop, here they are, here. So the stem 121 is what you should be looking at here. This is the lesion zone. There's the hole we put them in. And you can see that they are isolated here. I mean, I wouldn't call that a column, but there's like, you know, cells, right, in a somewhat isolated spot. But here's why it's exciting, is that's not exciting, right? So if you looked at that and you're being honest with me, you say that does not look like a motor column, right? But what's really interesting about this is that because of these ribbons are so small, the most cells we can put in one of these ribbons is about three to 5,000 cells. And that's what got me really excited. So I only put three to 5,000 cells in in each graft. And even that's the few, normally those would never, they, as a suspension, they would never live, at least in our hands, they would never live, even with all the magic sauce you put in with them. But just by stabilizing them in, in the alginate, we get survival, so they're existing. So obviously now in the future, what we wanna do is try to put them together with the stimulators. We're working out that protocol. So showing you a lot of work in progress. I hope you stayed awake. I know uh, we, we, um, we, it's more uh, tool building and uh, you know, goal building and team building, um, but uh, you know, I, think we're, I think we're turning the corner and a lot of these projects will reach maturity. We've kind of submitted papers on a lot of the um, tools uh, and I hope we'll be able to give you some uh, biological and functional data uh, soon. So some of the conclusions, um, you know, the interspinal wires, I think, are going to be, I think they're going to be challenging to do in people. I think that especially for forelimb or for hand function in humans, I, I think it's the danger probably will outweigh the utility. That's my personal opinion. I might be proven wrong. There's some great people doing electrodes in cats and showing relatively good uh, safety. So I think that the, the ventral multi-electrode multi array may be a really cool thing to do in people. And as you know, and it's an easier surgery, not easier, but it's more commonly done in humans is to come from the anterior. Many times we have to do a front and back procedure to stabilize the spine. So this is certainly feasible. And uh, preliminary data that stimulation actually might help you align transplanted cells. I also showed you that maybe pre- um, uh, allowing cells to interact with a matrix and differentiate into a matrix before implantation could take your the number of cells you have to put down into a spinal cord to a very very low level to one to the where you're actually creating a circuit and putting it in so maybe early feasibility uh, of that concept so I kind of thank people along the way and I'll thank you for listening and uh, there we are this uh, my daughter getting ready to leave uh, Seattle. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thanks for giving such a great talk. Oh, thanks. Um, and the fabrication of those flexible arrays is really something. Um, and, and it got me wondering um, regarding the Hebbian model that you thought about taking, uh, is it N2A neuron? B2A. B2A. Neuron. Mm -hmm. Sedatory tumor genetic virus with that neuron, and 
then also expressing an excitatory human genetic virus with neurons in the injured pool, and then yeah. stimulating that way to get only those neurons to fire. Great question. And the answer to your question, I did think of it. And I'll, I, I, just, I chose optogenetics, two different optogenetic uh, channels, right, right. wrote the grant, got funded. Right. Very difficult to do. I'll tell you what, it's one of those grants that I wish I didn't get. Um, and I'll tell you why. Because you need to put two different wavelengths of light in there. And again, we're trying to integrate into these ventral pools or into the ventral gray matter or intermediate gray matter. So you put an LED on top of the spinal cord, you lose most of the light by the time you get halfway in. Uh, Sarah Mandello, the grad student, she has a nice paper that was just published showing um, that you can do some mapping with optogenetics. So what we did is we engineered motor pools in the cervical cord with uh, a lentivirus expressing channel rhodopsin and then moved a, an LED array uh, over the surface of the cord. So we got that far. And then we've made a fiber optic uh, system with a, a side-firing fiber optic with a collaborator. Um, so we, and that, we've got those down to really, really fine fibers, uh, 30 micron in diameter. And that I can thread. I can put even multiple ones under the spinal cord so I can illuminate the bottom of the spinal cord. I have some data to show you on that. The thing that we haven't done is put them together. It is, it's the Herculean thing is getting the LED <laughs> engineered spinal cord. You know, these other uh, wavelength uh, uh, of light uh, for the transplanted cells, putting them in and getting both, you know. So getting it all to work, we're close. I think probably middle of next year we might actually do the experiment. But we, got, uh, we did get a grant for that, and, uh, you know, it was one of those grants where I think the reviewers were like, you know, <laughs> this would be great. I doubt you'll do it, but why don't you try? So I think um, you're absolutely – this is a great idea because that's what I'd love to do because then you can do – I mean, we chose optogenetic. Maybe chemogenic might have been easier. Optogenetic gives us the option of being able to do things like ask about truly about synchronicity in terms of frequency and pattern, you know, and that's, that's, you know, that's why we went that route. But definitely a great idea. If you know anybody wants to come work on it, uh, please let me know. What's that? Oh, it's there. <laughs> uh, Brian, you So, yeah, so, we, so that's a great question. We haven't done that. Um, um, but because we have this array, so what we did is we stimulated, uh, so there, it's basically two rows, it's eight electrodes, really. It's two rows of four. Um, we can build them in a variety of uh, arrays. And what we did is we stimulated in, in one direction. So the answer to your question is we haven't even done the control experiment and just do point to point, <laughs> see if we can keep them in one segment. Or as one of... Um, the, one of the postdocs wanted to do is actually can you create segmental, right? So can you stimulate point to point in one segment and another and will you get division? Can you create? So I don't know the answer to your question. Um, I, the other thing that we don't know, so we have, we have more things we don't know than we know. I mean, the other thing I don't know is how long, you know, over what period of time does this really happen, right? So this happened, um, it's pretty short. I think we were, cells were in there for two weeks. So it's a relatively short period, but I don't know the dynamics of this system. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Then also made me start to think about uh, which, you know, with even some of my discussions with colleagues here today, uh, you know, what happens to the glial populations when you're stimulating, right? What do you do there? Because you're now you're providing this, uh, you're really activating a circuit in a very specific way. So what are the glial cells doing? So are they orienting also in this field? Are they modifying the circuitry, local circuitry? And is that dynamic? Can you, if you have, you know, I mean, there's a lot of questions, but I, I wish I had answers. But yeah, fans. When you talk to your neurosurgical colleagues, yep. I don't know, you know, they say giddy up. So, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'm not being flippant, but I, I don't know, maybe those are the surgeons that I am working with right now, but they are eager to put stuff in the spinal cord. Yeah, I mean, not because of, um, I think in particularly the idea of low dose is really appealing to them. So the idea of implant, micro implanting a ribbon or something is something they get, they get, they get excited about. 
I don't know. I don't know. In fact, I, I, and maybe just, again, it may be the people in my department. I don't know. And they're not doing transplants, so maybe that's part of it. It's easy to be, maybe it's a bravado. <laughs> I don't know what it is. But uh, for the ventral approach, the ventral stimulator, um, we are going to do uh, a study with that. So we have some internal funding. Um, we're, 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 our goal is uh, actually probably talking to you more. We want to just test it out in a pig. Um, and see if, you know, kind of work out some of the details there. But there's a surgeon that's really interested in trying that for um, in human. Um, and they have uh, gone so far as kind of describe the design. That's not your question. Uh, but for cells, I don't know. I mean, um, I think I, if you'd asked me a few years ago, well, even l maybe a little more than that, I was definitely the person that said we shouldn't be putting cells in people. Right? I don't think we should put cells in people. I was really a naysayer. I kind of feel a little less strongly about it only because there's been quite a few cell injections done. And, you know, we really haven't seen a lot of negative side effects. But that's maybe not a good reason. But uh, I think surgeons are feeling the same. Yeah. And what makes them, I'm very curious, what makes them uncomfortable? So what do they, why, why is Well, I don't know. So like the surgeons that I've talked to, people who have like uh, cystic disease or spinal tumors, I mean, these guys tell me that there's, you know, to put to micro implant, that doesn't scare them. What scares them is a big volume of something. They don't want to put a big volume of something in there. But uh, when I described them, we can make these ribbons that are really small, and uh, they, they seem to be open to that. But um, the biomaterial part, I don't know. Maybe they haven't thought that through either. So um, we're a long ways away. So if, if you ask me, I'm nowhere near putting ribbons in people. Uh, obviously, stuff that's been going on here is much more advanced in terms of translation. Um, so, uh, you know, we're having... Uh, you know, uh, discussions like the at the water cooler with the surgeon, and they're like, "Yeah, I, I want to do that." So, but I don't know that that's really representative. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't, although, again, this has all been cervical, and I don't see any neuropathic pain in a hemi cervical contusion. Um, I guess I put an asterisk next to that because if you do that dorsal approach and you, and you mess with the uh, dorsal roots, you do, you do see, you'll see like some radicular like activation they're interested in, which, I, which we haven't done anything beyond that, but I know that they don't like it. Um, so I, I take I, I put that aside. You can't you can't damage those roots extensively and not get some kind of pain syndrome. I think, but uh, not when we do it uh, when things go well and put cells in cervical. Uh, thoracic might be a different um, issue altogether. I don't know. Uh, we have not. But if I go back in my life and look back, fetal transplantation. If you make the fetal graft too big, you get you can get bad outcomes and a lot of those are really intense like ridiculous you know pain where they're just this whole segment is 
you know, really irritated. I've seen it with those grafts, and those grafts do a lot. A lot of stim uh, sensory fibers love to migrate into those transplants. Um, and then uh, even with fibroblasts, engineered fibroblasts, I've seen some of that, depending upon the growth factor that we engineered to put in. So you can, um, I, you know, with this, again, I feel like if you, if you can minimally approach this, um, you, you're better off. But my, my philosophy has been, like, let's be really specific about replacing a limited amount of circuitry that that should be relatively safe. But, you know, we're coming from the dorsal surface, we're going through, you know, we're near the dorsal root entry zone, and how many, you know, of us have seen, you know, ingrowth in that region, you know, not only just from an injury, but from damage to the dura from that region. You, you can get, um, you know, sensory fiber and, and uh, you know, overgrowth beyond, you know, like the Lissauer tract, you know, invading beyond the superficial lamina. Uh, and that's, can't, that's probably, bad, right? So I think your question is really important. I think, so I'm, I guess I should probably, uh, you know, we don't, we don't, we used to, as per course in the beginning in Seattle, I should take that back. In the course in the beginning, we always did, um, you know, this is not, this is hyper algesia. We, we do uh, the Von Fry. We did those extensively. We did Von Fry. We didn't do anything else. We didn't do any other Test, which are there are many better ones, but we did do Von Fry. I would say for ten years in Seattle, and we never saw anything. But we didn't see it in our controls, even, but in our transplants either. So, but I don't think that's that's not a full answer to your question. But I'm just more interested in uh, the idea that you would appreciate about the cell therapy itself. Yeah. That I'm, you, there are processes, there are processes where cell therapy plus stimulation uh, is going to be good. Yeah. Aberrant sprouting and red pepper stain or other types of risk factors. So that's what I'm just. Saying. It's a great question, but you know, so if people who I mean, there's people now who are uh, getting dorsal, especially lumbar neuromodulation. Now they're not getting cell therapy, but just even by that idea, because they're really cranking on the dorsal root, right? So I don't even know. I mean, maybe uh, back to you. I don't know. Is there if people? I've never seen anything mentioned in any of the papers. Are there any risk? Is that a risk? Now you do see there is a lot of. There's more and more papers now coming out about the risks of epidural uh, stimulation and electrode failure, infection, um, you know, tethering, scarring. Um, there's actually some pretty. There's a few extreme cases, right, where people have actually had you know spinal cord damage from tethering and scarring from the electrode leads and these are just the the pain leads those are the pain leads right so i don't think it's um neuromodulation even though we say epidural is sort of minimally invasive it's still there's no question that there's going to be risks and um so when you put cells in i think i don't know so like if you put in cells uh we put in cells that are growth factor factories and you stimulate that could be scary right i guess right I don't know if you're putting a hematopoietic line in or bone marrow line, and they're making all these cytokines that uh, pain fibers like. Yeah, you might. That might be bad. Now you're getting me scared. Oh. Maybe one last question. Yeah. Do you know what type of pain you have? So from transplant point of view, what kind of pain treatment window would you select for people who are going to seek out this treatment? Great question. So we have. Um, so far, the data with the um, implanted arrays and now some data, which I didn't show you, just with the um, epidural array is, you know, we can start them in uh, rats at four weeks, which is basically when we do it. Um, we've now started some cortical, combined cortical and cervical stim, and um, four or six weeks out, you can get benefits pretty significant, right? And um, so I think that, you know, there's a pretty good window. What we've envisioned is that when the surgeon stabilizes your spine, they'll leave one of these arrays in there. That was our idea. So when do you need to, when, when you can put columns in? So I speak more uh, from the rodent timeline. So we know that in rodents anyway, there is this magic window, right? It's like after, sort of right at the time when the scars form, it's like seven to 14 days, 
Like a lot of cells like to be there. You can squirt them in there and they're really happy. If you eject younger, they don't do well at all. Eileen Anderson's done some nice data showing like the timing. If you go too late uh, and the scar is more significant, you don't, you really restrict the migration of the cells you put in. So you have to put more cells in. And that's one thing I think I would, if one, if one thing you take from my lecture, I, because we do this too, if you put a whole bunch of cells in there, you can break up all these matrices and you'll, and you'll get processes, but you're probably doing some things, you know, kind of vis-a-vis -vis Dalton was maybe not be good. So my answer to your question would be, um, there's probably going to be this magic window for surgically implanting cells where they're going to like to be happy in a human. And I don't know, uh, we, we try to do these time scales. It's probably sometime in the first six months, probably after injury when, you know, there's good vasculature and, you know, blood flow and everything is good, but you don't have the really hostile environment where, and then and there's, pla you know, we know there's like this burst of plasticity. So that's probably, that's when you want to put them in there. Um, chronic is a whole nother issue and it's, it's not an easy, it's not a, there's not an easy answer for that. It's a whole nother animal or a whole nother challenge. So, so I would envision this is, we have, we've, um, been working to develop a, it's kind of like an umbrella, basically it goes in through, um, you know, a, a port, uh, into the cervical region and comes out like an umbrella unfolds. And uh, the surgeons say oh, that's not going to be a problem. They just they're not worried about planting that. So that would go in just as per course of standard. It was standard of their uh, standard of care. Pops it in there. You use it or you don't use it. These things are so thin. We can even make them biodegradable. So the electrode arrays that we're making uh, now, we can make um, that they'll they'll be digestible in a year, right? And so, so I think that I really th that I'm really bullish on. Like I think we should we can try this pretty soon and think it's real. It can be relatively safe. And then. Uh, but the cell transplant, yeah, I think that window is probably needs to correlate right when your when your spine's pretty stable, inflammation is relatively reduced, it's a happy environment for transplant, and you're right in the you know really in the strong phase of rehab, and you're trying to get the most recovery you can. Probably that's when I would do it. Great question. Thanks for a brief. Thank you.